this is important to understand that in a short period of time, you can really understand a lot of comprehension that nobody, a lot of people just, I'm not going to say nobody, there are some over the years there started to be some more. <laughs> I like to think we were like a needle out there poking and saying, you know, please talk about this, you know, a little bit. But that confidence jump that happens when you're speaking to someone else that's at the same level you are, this is key. So I'm not saying you can't do it today. You probably can't find, you know, 10 or 15 people in your neighborhood that you can sit with that are all in Sodapana and want to go to Sodapana in fruition. That's difficult. But you might be able to find a Kali Mita that's progressing down the path and they're at the same level, the same markers as you are. And when you listen to their story and you give your story, you find out, oh, look at that. There's a lot that is just right there matching what happened to me and what happened to them. That's enough for you to say something's going on here, something worth looking at. And I think that's what we need to discover about TWIM. Something is really going on here. So I'm going to use, I'm obviously I'm wandering around testing and I'm watching your faces because it's good. I can see all of you. <laughs> Usually I can't see you. Okay. But the thing is, what is tranquil wisdom insight meditation? Where did that come from? What's going on, sister? We never heard of this before. Tranquil wisdom insight meditation. So obviously it's an attempt to show you that the Buddha was could have been, let's, let's do it this way, could have been practicing a practice that was simultaneously teaching like side by side, not on top of each other, side by side, he was teaching summit to practice and he was teaching insight. And it was happening simultaneously, but not on top of each other. So what are we talking about? We're talking about being able to reach and experience jhanas and understand where you're aware enough. And we call these aware jhanas. This is some of the terminology. Uh, an aware jhana is not the normal jhana that's being talked about. That absorption jhana, the, what's the definition of absorption? What is the state of my mind neurologically if I'm a, totally, completely in absorption? It's equivalent to trance state. Can I learn anything while I'm in it? No, that's why this is contrary to what we're, we're finding in the text. And, but in the text, Sariput is giving you an account in the Anupada Sutta step by step of what it is he's able to discover. And there's a lovely terminology for this as he's going on that makes you completely aware of the fact that this person is not in a trance while this is happening. He is not in absorption. So what is he doing? He's saying, here's what happens to him. Um, just one of the sections for you, I'm reading from Anupada Sutta, Majima Nikaya number 111. So one by one as they occurred, that's how he's seeing everything that's happening. One by one as they occur. And so he points it out in the sutta. This is the Buddha giving an account to the monks of the approval he's talking to them about of how Sariputta was practicing and why it is so good. Okay. And the states in the first jhana, the thinking and examining thoughts. Now, this is one place I'll show you where we change the words a little bit. In Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, he would say applied thought and sustained thought. And when I watch 30 people in front of me, they go, huh? Uh, what does that mean? Applied thought and sustained thought. It doesn't quite register with the person. But when Bhante changed this to thinking, where you think and start to think something, thinking uh, and examining thought. It means exactly the same thing, but all of a sudden the whole audience is sitting there in front of you going, oh, yeah, I know what that is, right? Where you have a thought come up and then it goes off into thinking and examining. The th thinking was to think the thought, the examining was to get involved in the mental proliferation about the thought. Talking about 
craving and clinging, actually. Okay. So here, the thinking and examining thought, the joy, happiness, and unification of mind. Now listen, the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind. Now, if we take those and we put them on a board, if you write them down, contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, you have on contact is body, feeling is feeling, perception's perception, thoughts, volition is thoughts coming up, volition is referring to thoughts rising up in this, and mind and consciousness are the same thing. So you actually have, he's telling you his five aggregates are totally and completely active. They're totally, completely active. Body, feeling, perception, thoughts and consciousness okay then it says the enthusiasm we change zeal to enthusiasm the reason we do that is because of the last days for the christians are full of zeal and it's not quite the same thing but the same definition and the synonym for it is really it's a synonym enthusiasm that kind enthusiasm so you have the enthusiasm decision energy mindfulness equanimity and attention if we write those down and we go to each one of them what is it meaning it's meaning you have the power while you're in the jhanas you have the power still to make decisions balance your energy apply your observation mindfulness means observation equanimity is balanced mind very balanced mind not non-reactive and attention is the proper amount of concentration, but the proper amount is not really pointed like, you know, pointed like this really hard. It's open. It's an open observation. Okay. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. So goes the, the recounting of this known to him those states arose he's aware known to the, him those states arose known they were present known they disappeared beginning middle and end of each thing that happens that's what they're doing <clears throat> he understood thus so indeed these states he repeats the whole thing now so indeed these states not having been there while i was meditating come into being they arise having been there for however period of time they vanish on their own impersonally they vanish okay then regarding those states this is especially important because this tells you exactly how sariputta's mind was the state of his mind while he was meditating this part says regarding those states he abided unattracted then unrepelled independent detached free dissociated with a mind rid of barriers what does it mean he abided unattracted not grasping for it in any way unrepelled not pushing anything away okay independent detached and free means independent is impersonal it's anatta, it's not atta, it's anatta, frame of mind. Independent, detached, and free means when I'm a scientist and I'm viewing something, I'm examining it, I'm not allowed to compare, compare to things in the past I know, or things somebody else read about that might be there in the future. I'm only allowed to look at something essentially as it is happening. Sariputta knew this when he was practicing. So he remained independent observation, detached, no opinion, and free, meaning anatta. He's dissociated from it. He's not going to get involved in that. He's just going to observe. How does he observe with a mind rid of barriers? Do you see how specific this is? This is wonderful. He's telling you exactly how Sariputta's mind was operating. All right, with a mind root of barriers means without any, without hindrances arising. That's a simple way to explain that. Now, so what happens when we say we're doing Samatha and Vipassana when in Vipassana we sit quietly and then we go through the insight 
pro process. But here we're seeing something different. We're seeing where he's practicing. And while he's practicing, there I saw Anicca. There I saw Anatta. Here I just realized what perception really was and come back. These are little insights that are happening. But he bumps out, experiences it, comes right back in, he keeps going. This gives us an idea. Maybe he found something that people could do all the time in life. It explains why so many people were involved in it in his time when he was teaching. He had to be giving something um, to the people that was pragmatic, means practical, something practical they could use. Ah, this even brings up another subject about this. And, and that is the um, reciprocity, the word reciprocity. Something that is reciprocal between me and Everett. If I make some an agreement with Everett and I make this agreement, you make this agreement, you do it to get some kind of benefit and I do it to get some kind of benefit, correct? Okay, so when the monks are teaching the people, we look back, we say, what was it that was being taught that was, ah, Sanditiko, Akaliko, Eipasiko, Opanayako, Pachitam, Weditabo, Winuichi. What was it that was that? And what did I just say? Whatever it was he was teaching was easy to understand, immediately effective here and now. Okay. It was, um, no, right. right. Easy to understand, immediately effective here and now. Bati, you're going to have to help me. I'm going blank. <laughs> Timeless. Immedi uh, like, uh, um, okay, immediate, it's easy to understand, immediately effective. Timeless. Oh, inviting inviting a deeper <laughs> inspection was the last one. And, and that's the come and see. Always bothered me. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to look over the wall in Anthony's yard and say, hey, Anthony, come see what I found? Essentially, that is going on. That was going on because they were so excited about being given something that they wanted to tell other people about. Okay, but what was the reciprocity means? They were getting something worthwhile enough for them to help them in their daily lives that they would make an agreement even in the time of the buddha at that time to support the monks so they would have four requisites what four requisites did the monks have to survive they had to have food they had to have shelter they had to have their robes and when they needed robes or cloth and they had to have um they had to medicine. have um, thank you medicine this, these are the four requisites for the monks. So what, what was it that made these people who are incredibly poor, okay, make this agreement for a reciprocal agreement? What was the reciprocity that was involved in this? If, he, if they were teaching the people something they could use all the time in life, and all the time, and it would keep getting better and better gradually for them in their heads, and they would understand things clearly as they were going along. If they were giving them something that they could use in life to keep impinging the mind, keep telling the mind, I don't want to react anymore, I want to respond to life. See? So what could they have been teaching them that was so priceless? Okay. And the Eightfold Path tells us what he figures out, He the, what the Buddha figured out. He had to have sustained and he had to have this in place in order for the meditation to happen and the meditation to open and be beneficial to him in life. So that's what he was teaching the people. Most of the Eightfold Path, when you look at the Eightfold Path, you have eight pieces, okay? And the first three, uh, Bhante helped me do this. They divide it into three, but all eight of them have to be operating at one time. Unfortunately, some people interpret this. Once I have these up top, those are your morality part. Once I'm keeping the precepts and I have the morality part, I don't have to worry about those pieces anymore. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like that because when we looked deeper to say, why did he say eight? And why did he say eight folds? 
an eightfold path. Well, they have these fans. They have fans over here when you're in Asia. And it comes actually, this idea of this fan comes from one tree that actually looks like a fan when you take the piece off and you see these big things they were waving over the Buddha, you know, you see them in pictures and they look like a great big fan. Actually, it's a one leaf of a, a tropical plant, okay? And it looks like that. I'm taking a piece of paper like this and I'm gonna fold it in half like this, okay? Then I'm gonna fold it again like this. And then I'm gonna fold it again. Now I should have eight folds in, in this, and if I open this up, this gets more and more fun. The more that you read, the pieces come that you learn about. When we take this apart like this, and then we refold it so it's like a fan, okay? And when I refold it like a fan, I'm gonna demonstrate something for you. We can't take apart that eightfold path. We're not supposed to be picking that thing apart, <laughs> okay? Because here's how you get cool. If you want to reach Nibbana, Nibbana means no more fire, no more heat of craving, no more reactions, no more worries, worries, worries about the future, no more anger, anger, anger about the past, which causes all this heat and emotion stuff to come up. Once you know you're free of that and you're living right here in this cool spot, now you come back and from the experience in Nibbana, when you turn back on, I decided a couple weeks ago how to explain this. It's like having a newborn brain. You know, I had five kids and watching them when they're little, how come these little children can learn so fast? How can they learn languages and memorize stuff and learn really, really fast, but we can't do that. How come? It's because they don't have any baggage in there yet. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have any baggage from the past. They don't have any baggage from the future uh, that they're worry, worry constantly. They're, they're just living, you see? So we tell you, you can discover how to reclaim this kind of, um, I, it's like for children, we say wonderment of discovering that dinner is ready when you get home. <laughs> or that the taxi is there when you come out of work, or that you know new trees are all of a sudden blooming on the highway, things must be getting better. You know, you, you start noticing things. Why? Because you're not so wrapped up in worried about what's going to happen next in the future, which you, the future's not here yet. So you're not giving today's energy to the future and you're not giving today's energy to the past anymore because you know what? No matter how you cut the cake, that event is back there and it had energy in it, whatever it was, no matter how terrible it was, it had energy in it when it happened. But if, you, if I sit here now and I start to think about those old events and wrap myself up and get upset about those old events, thinking about that, getting depressed about it, everything else, I'm getting stuck doing something that's not good. I'm giving today's energy for my life energy for today to the past. It isn't anything to do with the energy of the event in the past. You're not reliving that event. You can say that, but you're not. You're actually spending time thinking about something that happened in the past, but you're using today's energy. This is an important lesson if you don't learn anything else today. Okay, <laughs> so th these, eight, these eight folds that are here, if I go like this, I can cool myself. This was just something silly I came up with. I, I can cool myself. But if I get rid of the three for morality and they, some people say, well, okay, you, you learn morality. Now we'll get rid of these three. We'll just get rid of them, right? And when we do that, uh, we only have a piece that's this big now and it only has five folds in it. And that's no good, it doesn't work very well. And then someone else I saw teaching that you can get rid of two more. Well, it, it, this one is pretty hard, it's not much left. <laughs> and by the way, I'm in Mumbai and they say it's 86 degrees, feels like, I love their, their broadcast. They say it's 86 degrees Fahrenheit, feels like 105. 
I'm the only one of it talking about. And then I got up to take a walk and do something and I came back in immediately. I said, I can't walk. I mean, if I walk five or six steps, I'm absolutely swimming. I'm so hot. I'm just swimming. So this is really, really hot. But so you can't really get cool with this fan until we get rid of two more. And if we get rid of two more, like one, you know, some people say you can get rid of two more. And so if we get rid of two more, then we only have three pieces left. Now look at how small this is. This is kind of ridiculous. I can't do anything with this. I can't get cool. <laughs> Not going to work. Okay, so then we come to the conclusion. We didn't have to have the teacher tell us. We figured it out ourselves. We have to have all eight pieces of the Eightfold Path operating. 